All right, welcome to Unit 3 on Collecting Data. This video focuses on examples of experimental designs. So we learned, learned about an introduction to experimental design. We learned all the little tidbits that go into it. Now what I'd like to do is take a look at a couple examples. So here's example one. A doctor wants to determine if wearing a nicotine patch helps smokers quit the habit. So he gets 300 smokers who take part in the experiment. So let's talk about the who is involved here. So the 300 smokers are the subjects, or you could call them experimental units. The explanatory variable is the presence of the nicotine patch or absence of the nicotine patch, right? And the response variable is quitting or not. So response variable is going to be a categorical thing. Um, did you quit? Yes or no? And then the explanatory variable is did you wear the patch as well, which is another categorical variable. So he randomly assigns 150 of the smokers to wear a nicotine patch on their upper right arm and the other 150 to wear a similar looking patch, but with no active nicotine in the patch. Each subject gets a number, 00 through 100, I'm sorry, 001 through 300, and he uses a random number table to select the first 150 uh, numbers, ignoring repeats and numbers no one has. Now here, the two treatment groups are the active patch group and the control group that got a placebo, they got a fake patch. Now let's make sure we really truly understand why we're using that placebo. If I send 150 people home knowing they got nothing to help them quit smoking and the other, the other 150 know that they got something to help them quit smoking, that could become a confounding variable in of itself. And that's just because when you're in an experiment, when you know you got something, you are kind of automatically going to have a little bit of a feeling of, hey, this might help me. And the problem is I can't take that away, nor can I give that. That's just natural that happens with your work with human beings. So by giving everybody something, at least it levels the playing field and it allows everybody to go home thinking they're getting something. So that is actually a way that I am blinding my subjects. They don't know what they're getting. And I'm also forming control by controlling the fact that everybody will think they're getting something. Now let's look a little bit more detailed at this. So what it says is at the end of the three months, the subjects will be asked if they quit smoking by blinded evaluators. The doctor will compare the proportion of people who wore the active patch that quit smoking and the proportion of smokers who wore the fake patch and quit smoking. So it's important that the evaluators, even though they're just asking the question, did you quit smoking or not? I want those people to also be blinded. That way this could be a double blind study. If the researcher does the asking, well, if the researcher is hoping that the nicotine patch works, he might have a tendency to maybe lie that some of the people in the nicotine patch group were quitting smoking when they really did it. Now, you would assume nobody would do that, but you never know. All right. Now, it's also important at the end here, I am going to compare the two different proportions and see how big of a difference there is or maybe a lack thereof. So let's kind of go through the four pillars just to show how everything is here in this really well done experiment. First, we do have comparison. There were two similar groups to compare. I had 150 people wearing the patch with nicotine, 150 people wearing the fake patch. Now, that is two groups, and you at least have to have two groups to compare if you're going to call it an experiment. All right, I also had randomization because who received what treatment was completely random, and I did describe that process in the previous slide. Now, remember, why do we have randomization? There are lots and lots of other lurking or confounding variables here. There are lots of reasons why somebody could quit smoking besides my patch or fake patch. So the idea here is that I can't control exercise, diet, um, family support, lack of family support, um, ethnicity, age, gender, all these things that might help somebody quit smoking, I can't control. But this is where randomization helps me out. Randomization evenly disperses all of those other variables into both groups. So before I give them the patch or the fake patch, both groups are extremely, extremely similar in the sense that they are nice, mixed up, having all different sorts of people within them. That's a good thing. Now, replication is the fact that I have 150 people in each group. That's a lot. Anything more than one is good. And how did I form control here? Now, um, time, how long you wear the patch could be a confounding variable. Well, I made sure everybody wore it for three months. What part of your body you put the patch on could be a confounding variable. I made sure it wasn't by having everybody put on their upper right arm. I also used the placebo. And again, that was a form of control because that allowed everybody to think that they were involved in the experiment. 
Now again, there are many lurking variables, but those variables should be evenly dispersed between the two groups because of my randomization. I also noted that this was double blinded because I was able to blind the subjects and the evaluators. As long as the patch looked the same, except I knew as the researcher which ones had the nicotine. Here is a picture of this experiment. So it starts with a random assignment of the 300 people, 115 to the treatment group getting the actual patch, 150 going to the control group getting the placebo. And then at the end, I'm going to compare the um, proportions, compare the people that quit smoking. So um, yes, this is important. This bottom statement here is so important. Lurking variables do not bias the results because the treatment is randomly assigned. Patients in the treatment group shouldn't be different on average than patients in the control group. A lot of kids will try to say, what about all these other confounding lurking variables? Aren't they going to lead to bias? No, they're not going to lead to bias because my trust in the randomization process will make two groups that are on average very, very similar, right? Patients should not be different. Now, at the end of the day, could there be a couple more females in one group than the other? Could there be a couple more people that exercise in one group than the other? Sure. But on average, the two groups are very, very similar. And that is why I don't have bias, because I made these two groups very similar. All right, let's look at look, one more example. We're going to kind of actually give you guys a chance to answer them these questions. So a school district superintendent wants to know if attending a professional development training will increase the math knowledge of elementary teachers in his district. So his population of interest is elementary teachers in his district, and he wants to see if the explanatory variable, professional development, will change the response variable, math knowledge. The school superintendent selects 100 elementary teachers and randomly selects 50 of them to attend the professional development. And the other 50 obviously don't. After the training, he gives the content quiz to all 100 teachers and compares the average score for teachers who attended versus teachers who did not. Who are the subjects? The 100 elementary teachers are the people who actually got assigned something. What is the treatment and the treatment group? The treatment group is the group that actually went to the professional development and the control group is the group that didn't. Now, is there a placebo? No. This is a scenario where, unfortunately, I cannot give somebody fake professional development. What am I going to make them go to professional development where they're, they're taught bad math or they're just told to sit there? I mean, you really can't do that. So this is a great example where you just can't use a placebo. So some people are going to know that they're not getting anything. But think about it. If the superintendent behind closed doors selects the 100 teachers, of those 100 teachers, he does random assignment and selects the 50 that are going to go to professional development. If he only tells those 50, hey, I'm going to send you guys this professional development, he doesn't even tell the other 50 teachers that were picked anything. Like, they don't even know that they were picked. All he's going to do is, hey, hey, everybody come on into the auditorium. I'm going to have you guys take a math content quiz. He's not even going to tell them that there was an experiment going on, right? That, in a sense, is blinding them. Now, at the end of the day, they cannot be officially blind because one group knows they're getting a professional development and the other group, whether they know it or not, is not getting anything. So you got to be very careful how you understand that. But if you think about the nature of the experiment, this should still work. Why do lurking variables not bias the results? This is what I just got done explaining, and I think it's worth explaining again. Remember, there are lots of confounding variables. How many years the teachers have been teaching, the general intelligence of the teachers, older teachers, younger teachers, male teachers, female teachers, um, general IQ of the teachers. There's lots of confounding variables that, or lurking variables that could determine what score they get. But because I randomly put 50 into each group, I'm evenly dispersing those variables among the two treatment groups, making the two treatment groups very, very similar on average. Yes, at the end of the day, there's still two, di two different groups, but there should be a nice mix of people in each group that if one group gets better, well, you know what? That group had older people in it, so did the other group. Well, that group had younger people in it too, so did the other group. So at the end of this, we hopefully can say that the professional development did cause those teachers to become more intelligent for math. All right, guys, those are two pretty simple examples, and I hope you understand all the little aspects of this. This did have comparison. There were two groups. It did have randomization in terms of what treatments were handed out to who. 
It did have replication. I had 50 people in each group. That's replication. And it did have some control um, in the sense that, like I said, um, just don't even tell the people that they're in the experiment, right? Just tell 50 to go professional development. Don't tell the other 50 anything. And there are some other things that we can control, like how long do they have to work on the test? Everybody gets 60 minutes. Everybody takes the same test. I can't, it would be dumb to have a couple different tests out there. Um, things like that are things that you can control as well to make sure that they do not become confounding variables or lurking variables. All right, guys, hopefully these two ex examples kind of helped, you know, explain all the concepts. So you can actually see them and, you know, at work. And we'll look at a lot more examples in class as well.